this is truly one of the greatest honors in ministry for me to to have someone that is truly my favorite author come and share with our community. I remember the first time I read Divine Conspiracy. I actually read half of it and then lost it. And, but lost it because I had stopped reading it and I, it was too much for me. And then I read another book, The Great Omission. And for some reason that opened the door that when I went back to Divine Conspiracy it became my favorite book. I've read it four or five times. And I, I can't tell you how much the writings of Dallas Willard has transformed my life personally. Dallas, I want to say thank you for introducing me to what it means to really follow Jesus in my life and to take seriously what he taught. Everyone, would you please give a hand to our guest speaker this morning, Dallas Willard. After a wonderful invitation or introduction like that, you know, you're almost afraid to say anything because <laughs> you might ruin your reputation. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here and thankful to have an opportunity to talk with you a, a little bit about your theme of being church. And I especially would like to try to say some things about how you do it because the words that you would read in the scripture uh, really look pretty intimidating, don't they? And it's a little like trying to board the airplane when it's 300 feet off the ground already. And uh, so I want to uh, try to put some very practical meaning into this idea of being the church. Now you have these wonderful words in Ephesians 1 that I believe you've been looking at where P Paul gives his prayer for the church at Ephesus. He says, verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Yeah, well, how do you do that in the local situation? What are the riches in the saints? What is that? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Well, again, how do you do that? I mean, suppose, suppose Paul's prayer was answered. Uh, in your fellowship uh, is this actually talking about a fellowship or is it talking about something much greater than that Paul goes on to say far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as the head over all things in the church to the church which is his body the fullness of him that fills all in all how do you relate to that what are you doing today and tomorrow and through the coming weeks that is a part of this well, you see, I think that we are given to be a part of this now. And I'm afraid that many people will kind of sit back and say, well, Paul prayed for it, so I don't have to do anything. Right? And when you, when you read in John 15, where I understand you've also been working in recent weeks, and you hear Jesus say, without me you can do nothing. What is the appropriate response to that? 
And many people think, whether they say it, well, the response is, do nothing. But if you are assured that without Christ we can do nothing, you also want to be assured that if you do nothing, it will be without him. Now one of the greatest blocks to the power of Christ and his people today is passivity. It's the idea that it's all done for us. And the idea that grace makes you passive and if you got active, God might be nervous. So let me just talk today briefly about some of the things that we must do to live in the reality that Christ and Paul and the scriptures generally set before us as what is given to us in God's plan. Just a few things. I'm very glad that we read Psalm 1 uh, because Psalm 1 brings out the active side of the life that we live in Christ. That Psalm says, first of all, what the blessed person doesn't do. They don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly and so on. And then there's the but. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and therein he meditates day and night. Now, that is how you do it. But you're apt to say, you mean I got to do that? Are you serious? That I would meditate in the law day and night? In the case of the Christian, we have something better than the law to meditate on, and that is Jesus Christ. And let me just say, because I don't have a lot of time to talk there, I'm going to talk a while and then we're going to have an inquisition. <laughs> and that'll probably be the best part by far. <laughs> but the first thing, if you're going to be the church, is to have your mind always fixed on Christ. Always. Now, if you do that, that will take care of 99% of the issues you'll face. Is if you have Christ always before your mind. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is set on you because he trusts in you. You want to trust in God? You want to trust in Christ? Keep him before your mind. You can do that. But you have to want to do it. question Dallas I this is one that I'm personally struggling with a lot I hate to jump to spiritual disciplines right away because I know if we're not careful that can turn into a legalism but so we need to understand that disciplines are training versus trying trying training us to be like Jesus in your mm -hmm. words I think many of us have that understanding when we get to the practical element of disciplines and those rhythms in our daily life it's difficult especially in America today and my wife and I just had a we have a, a one and a half year old and then she's pregnant again and so oh, that's especially wonderful. oh thank you yeah, <laughs> yeah she, but that's wonderful uh, but and, and it, it is a blessing but I know a lot of parents in particular wonder where do I find the time mm -hmm. you know I go to work all day and then I come home and the kids are screaming and I change the diapers and it's nine o'clock and they're in bed and I'm exhausted 
I think a really practical question that a lot of moms and dads are wondering is, what's a good way? Do you have, do you have anything you can speak into that for us who are frustrated and want to do more but are having a tough time finding the time? Well, no, that's really, I think, where the battle sets in. And uh, the first thing you have to be willing to do is to plan for some significant time to come to understand why you don't have enough time to do the things that are good for you. See, uh, you have to say, I am going to figure this out. Okay? There is a reason. A part of it is theological. You have to ask yourself questions like, does God ever give anyone too much to do? What do you think about that? See, Now, I'm inclined to think that he doesn't. So if I have too much to do, then the question is, where did that come from? How about me? Why do I do that? Who am I trying to please? What are the desires that I am following? And that's where uh, you have to find the time to begin to seriously look at the causes of your behavior. Now, if it's a one and a half year old baby, you don't want to throw that out. That's a keeper. <laughs> uh, but the problem is to locate the source resources. And that may be sharing life with other people. And our, one of the things that makes it so hard on families now is we normally don't have others in our house to help us. See, for most of our history, we have had what, we're, what now is called multi-generational -gener homes, where you had people at various levels, and useless people like grandparents. <laughs> and uh, so we now have to rethink that. How did we get the situation? Why do we live in the arrangements that we do? And that's where the work of examination to find the causes. Now that's going to challenge your faith because perhaps you are devoted to success. And success in some professions like accountant, lawyer, and so on will eat you alive. And so then you have to decide whether or not that is an objective for you to give your life to. And Lord knows today ministers are often eaten alive by the need to succeed. And so we all have to look at that issue. What is success in human life? How does success relate to the gifts of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. What is my part in developing the gifts of the Spirit? Because again, the Spirit does not make you passive. Truth doesn't make you passive. So we have to give a fearless examination. Hopefully we would have pastors and counselors that could help us uh, to find the time to do the things that we need to do. There's a, a book called Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. You know that book? We need to write a book, Seven Habits of Highly Unsuccessful People, <laughs> because the habits are the problem. And of course, one of the, I think it's the seventh habit, is sharpening the saw. So you don't have time to sharpen the saw, so it takes you twice as long to cut down the tree. Now, is that efficiency or what? Right. So the question is, how can you accomplish what God wants you to accomplish? That means, among other things, how do you let him into your life? But the temptation is just to work hard. 
And if there's a problem, the solution is work harder. And it's only by finding our way into life in the kingdom of God that we can break the grip of that and give God a chance to show up. Now, now, what is your, your best advice or guidance to someone who's never really engaged or practiced these disciplines to um, ease into them in a way to not feel that guilt or that burden when, it, you know, oh, I forgot today, you know, or yeah. what's, is there a, uh, some guidance that you give to people? Yeah, in practicing disciplines, you want to be experimental and you want to be easy. Do not be heroic. And that is one thing that hurts people in multitudes when they start thinking about this, is they think, well, the object is to be as miserable as you can be. <laughs> and it doesn't help. Uh, and now, when you're learning these things, whether it's solitude or fasting or scripture memorization, there is some initial discomfort because you're breaking habits. And any time you're breaking habits, that's going to cause discomfort, maybe even pain, and you're going to fail. So when you're, when you're entering disciplines, you want to do it as a happy student of Jesus. Right? And you don't want to make yourself miserable. Uh, the idea that where there's no pain, there's no gain, that's some football coach thought that up. <laughs> But actually, it's, it's pretty silly. You, if you look around, you'll see there's a lot of gain without much pain, and there's a lot of pain without any gain. So you observe, you're experimental. As you go into a discipline, you expect some resistance. Your eye is on the Trinity, really, but the friendly version of the Trinity is Jesus. And so you keep your mind fixed on him, and you ask him to help you learn. And when you fail, you don't just try again. You find out why you failed, you fix that, and then you try again. I once uh, had a, was doing a seminar retreat, and someone who was, uh, who was at JPL here in Southern California, he said, boy, it's really true. When we blow up a rocket, we don't just try again we find out what went wrong. Then we try again. See, that's experimental. Now, since you're not thinking in terms of, oh, I sinned, I'm a miserable wretch, but rather you're thinking in terms of making something work, then you can be experimental. And if you tried to fast and the food in the refrigerator kept calling you, and you finally gave in, well, why did you? See, So those are the kinds of things I would say. You need to be in fellowship when you do this. It really helps if you have others that are walking with you, friends that you can trust. Uh, I, I watch people who are going together and see how much comfort and strength they are, both in their failures and their successes. And see, you could, a church could devote itself to that sort of thing if it wanted to. Um, if you made discipleship and discipline central, then you could see astonishing progress in the lives of people. Dallas, I suspect you've thought a little bit about this connection between spiritual gifts and the marketplace. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I think this is a tremendously important question. And uh, I would rephrase it in part as, do you expect people who run banks and schools to live in the power of God? What is a gift? A gift is a particular function in which supernatural power is exercised. And that is distributed in the body of the church because the church needs it. Now the question is, are there gifts for running the bank, or running service masters, or whatever. That, I think, is the, is the primary question that you, you are raising. I would say, without question, there are gifts. And they are manifested. 
in the lives of those who bear them. And different people have different gifts. Uh, and we have outstanding examples of Abraham and Isaac who were so alive in God that they were scary. One of the things I hope to do in the afterlife is have some long discussions with Abimelech, their nervous neighbor. <laughs> and he was nervous because he said, it's manifest God is with you. And that is the blessing of Abraham that is cited later in discussions with Jacob. And then Paul brings it up in Galatians 3, 13 to 14, that the blessing of Abraham should come upon the Gentiles. What was the blessing of Abraham? God was with him in everything he did. See, now that to me is, is the big issue. We don't give uh, the excellent uh, Christian uh, businessman something to do at church. We give him something to do with his business, which is glorify God in everything that he does.